how quickly we have moved through the gospel of Luke. Luke began his gospel by telling us that it was the purpose God had put on his heart to give us an orderly account of the things that Jesus both said and did so that we might know with certainty the exact truth concerning the things of Jesus who is called the Christ. Now folks, from the fifth verse of the very first chapter of Luke's gospel, Luke began to show us the divine purpose for the Son of God's dramatic entrance into the world he had made. An entrance that was heralded by a man called to make straight the ways of the Lord. An entrance that was announced by an angel that said that this Jesus would come to save people from their sins. He was welcomed by a heavenly chorus that's saying, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And Luke allows us to see very quickly the purpose and the plan of God for his son's journey among men upon the earth. When Jesus was just eight days old, his parents carried him to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. And there in the providence of God, they ran into Simeon. And Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and he said, Now my eyes have seen your salvation, God. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The prophetess Anna also saw Jesus and she called this little baby God's redemption. And Jesus himself, though he had to grow in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man, reminded Mary and Joseph when they came and found him in the temple why he had come to this world. And who he was when he said, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Even before Jesus began his public ministry, John the Baptist began to prepare people for his coming, saying, All flesh will see the salvation of God. And then... When Jesus began his work, he went to John the Baptist and he was baptized. And Luke tells us that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And that a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased folks even the devil even the devil knew why Jesus had come into this world and he tried to corrupt God's innocent lamb so that he could disqualify him from being one who would make a sacrifice for the sin of man he tried to divert Jesus from the cross, offering Jesus victory over all the kingdoms of the world, leading Jesus to avoid the agony of the cross. But Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Even while Jesus traveled with his 12 apostles, he made clear to them his purpose, why he had come. He said, behold, we are going to Jerusalem. And 
all the things that have been written in the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. They will scourge him and they will kill him. But the third day, he will rise again. And then at the Last Supper, Jesus again told his disciples plainly what was about to happen. He said of the bread, this is my body, broken for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So on to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went. Not seeking to avoid his betraying disciple, but going there to meet him. Not hoping to avoid the cruel guards who would take him to their wicked masters, but submissively yielding himself to them not only restoring the ear that Peter lopped, lopped off the servant of the high priest, but by his will literally holding back the legions of angels in heaven who would in a moment come and rescued him from the hands of murderous men. Folks, Jesus voluntarily, Jesus resolutely, Jesus intentionally, purposefully moved toward the cross. In the trials, Jesus offered no defense of himself. He clearly spoke about who he was, the great I am, but he did nothing to try to dissuade them from pronouncing the sentence that would take him to the cross. He was, as Isaiah declared some 800 years before, led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent so he opened not his mouth when the cowardly Roman governor gave in to the bloodthirsty demands of the priest and the crowd Jesus began his final steps toward the cross Stand with me now as we read Dr. Luke's account that leads us to the culmination of the completion of the purpose of the Son of God in departing from the glory of heaven and coming down to walk the dusty roads of Palestine. Perhaps as we read you might also see the reason I have given this message a strange title Friday April the 15th 2 12 and 24 seconds in the afternoon Beginning in Luke 23, 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. 
and they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. And an inscription was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and then the sun was darkened. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. You may be seated. As carefully as Luke documented the purpose of Christ's coming, Luke also carefully records the detail of the fulfillment of that purpose. The crucifixion of the only begotten Son of God began at 9 a.m. Before the agony of hanging upon the cross for six hours even began, Jesus had already suffered horribly. Even in Gethsemane, Our physician friend Luke says he sweat great drops of blood. Before the mockery of the trials began, the soldiers hit Jesus in the face. During the night, they blindfolded him and repeatedly struck him in a cruel game of guess who? By the time Jesus stood before Pilate, he was already battered, bruised, dehydrated, exhausted from a night without sleep. And then Pilate tries to placate the crowd and to acquit himself from judicial murder by having Jesus scourged. Jesus was stripped of his clothes. His hands were tied to a post above his head. A Roman legionnaire took the flagellum and prepared to administer 39 lashes across his back, his shoulders, 
and his legs. This brutal whip was made of several strips of heavy leather. And then the ends of the pieces of the leather were embedded small balls of lead and pieces of broken bone so that when the lash came across him, they would penetrate and grab the skin and peel it back as the whip was removed. With each lash, the leather cut the skin and often the tissue underneath, producing excruciating pain and heavy bleeding. The balls of lead made deep bruises in the flesh that with repeated blows broke open. At the end of the scourging, the skin of Jesus' back hung like long ribbons and the entire area was unrecognizable. I won. I wonder if God actually showed Isaiah the prophet in a kind of nightmare prophecy exactly what would happen to God's Messiah, his own son. Because Isaiah wrote with such precision in chapter 53, surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Actually, the cross the Romans used normally looked like a capital T. But when the staff on which the sign Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews was attached at the top. It would look like the traditional shape of the cross in a small t. It was a cruel practice of the Romans to require the condemned man to carry the crossbar of the cross up the road of Golgotha, which meant the shape meant Skull Mountain because of its shape. When the main support was upright, firmly planted in the ground, the events would have taken place like this. The crossbar was laid at the foot of the upright. Jesus was shoved backward upon it. The rough wood and the dirt painfully scraping his lacerated back. The legionnaire would have found the hole in between the bones of the wrist of his arm and would drive a spike in between them. With the aid of ropes, the crossbar with Jesus attached to it would be hoisted into the air and affixed to the upright already in place. Then with his knees slightly bent, his feet would have been forced together and nailed either through the arches or the heels. Death on the cross was filled with agony. As the weight of the body pulled upon the arms, and in response, the victim attempted to support himself with his legs. The pain of tearing flesh and pinched nerves moved from arms to legs, 
cramps often with violent convulsions, loss of breath, crushing pain in the chest. These were the things that Jesus endured upon the cross for us. Folks, Jesus endured almost indescribable physical suffering for us from nine in the morning until noon. But the worst part of the agony of the cross was still to come. At noon, things changed. Luke tells us darkness covered the earth. For the next three hours, God the Father fulfilled what Isaiah described, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 53. He said, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God the Father began with the sin of Adam and then of Eve. Of Abel and Seth and all of his brothers and sisters and children. And one by one. The Father took each of the sins of mankind and laid them upon his own dear Son. And so he proceeded minute by minute, hour upon hour, throughout all the people of history, past, present, future. Folks, sometime between those hours of noon and 3 p.m., he came to the name and the life of Michael Allen Clonch. As I studied again this chapter of Luke this week, And as I prepared this message to share with you this morning, I thought about my time at the cross. I decided to consider when in those hours of torture, as Jesus bore the sin of the world, when was my time when did he bear my sins now I admit frankly I cannot calculate it with any certainty but I really wanted to meditate upon when my sins were put upon Jesus so I began to figure it the very best I could I took the number of years from creation to the end of the millennial kingdom, the very best that I can understand that length of time from the scriptures. And then with the assumption that our sins were laid upon Jesus in the order in which we were saved, I figured when in those 180 minutes of darkness the Father would have taken my sins and laid them upon Jesus. And the best that I could figure, it was Friday, April the 15th, 29 A.D., two twelve and 24 seconds in the afternoon. God the Father took the multitude of my wicked deeds 
every selfish word I've ever spoken. The long, long list of my evil thoughts. Every sinful motive that found a home in my soul. And he put my sins on Jesus. Jesus became guilty of every sin I have ever done. And yes, every sin I will yet do. But folks, the Father also at some point came to your name and to yours and yours and yours and yours as well. He came to your name and to your life and to your sin until finally he came to the name of of the last man or woman that would ever be born upon this sin-cursed earth in a natural body. And after that sin had been put on Jesus, we read from our beloved physician friend, now it was about the sixth hour there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened. The veil of the temple was torn into. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. <laughs> no wonder the earth shook. The Spirit of God took the veil that hung in the temple, the symbol of separation from holy, holy, holy God and sinful, sinful man. And he ripped it in two from top to bottom. For with the price of redemption forever paid, his work upon the cross completed, the purpose for which he had come accomplished. The way for sinful man to be able to come and abide in the presence of his creator was forever opened. The price for sin forever paid. The way of salvation forever provided. Eternal life forever offered. What Jesus did upon the cross enabled Paul later to write these words to the Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And to further write that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Folks, I am a very, very blessed man. God has seen to it that I have been under the teaching of God's word since I was still a baby in the womb of my mother as she carried me faithfully every week to church. After I was born, two weeks later, I was 
in the nursery at church. But the first church that I ever remember attending was in the western part of Houston, Texas. And I was a preschooler. I remember as a preschooler because they didn't have kinder church or kids' own life. And I remember as a preschooler standing there in the pews and singing. And I remember my daddy bending down and telling me I couldn't sing Davy Crockett while everybody else was singing <laughs> hymns. So I decided I needed to learn their songs. I was just starting to read. The words in the hymnal were hard. But I started to learn the songs the church was singing just by listening and repeating. The first hymn I remember learning and loving. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I had done he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. It took a couple of years for me to really figure out the meaning of those words of a song that I love to sing it kind of came to a culmination when I was playing with a friend called Ruth Ann who lived across the street. In the backyard one day after school, she said, yesterday God gave me a new heart. <laughs> I didn't really understand what she meant. <laughs> but I knew somehow it was connected to what Jesus did on the cross. Not long after that, I asked my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Wright, about what Ruthie had said. I asked her also about the song that I love to sing. And Mrs. Wright helped me put it all together to understand what Jesus had done on the cross for me. And I invited Jesus to also come into my heart, to come into my life. And I trusted him as my Lord and as my Savior. Now, although I'm not a singer, a fact which I do not need to convince you but I love to sing I love to sing and the songs I love the best are the songs about what Jesus did for me on the cross 
I sing these songs just as an act of worship to him. I sing these songs for me so I can meditate on his endless grace. Folks, thinking about what he did for me on the cross motivates my life for him. Folks, I am further from perfect than any of you could possibly imagine. But whatever good things I've done in my life, whatever obedience I've practiced, whatever surrender I've made, if there is anything at all in my life that's pleasing to the Lord, it is all because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. I wonder... Are there some of you here today that you have already trusted Christ? He is your Lord and Savior. But you, like me, need to meditate on what Jesus did on the cross specifically for you. Would you just bow your head for a moment? Would you just tune other things out for just a few seconds and begin to think about what Jesus did on the cross for you? I wonder if you need to let Jesus' suffering and sacrifice motivate you. To live for him more faithfully. To move you to serve Christ more selflessly. Does it need to to move you to give to the Lord more generously? Do you need to think about Jesus' suffering and his sacrifice for you? to motivate you to share your testimony and the gospel more regularly and to worship him more sincerely. While your heads are bowed, I'm going to start singing at the cross another time, not for you to hear, because I hope that within a short time you will out sing me and actually drown me out but here's how I believe the Lord wants us to do it this morning you stay seated with your head bowed your eye closed just meditating upon the cross what Jesus did for you when your meditation moves you to say Because of the cross, I want to live for Christ more faithfully. I want to worship him more sincerely. I want to serve Jesus more selflessly. I want to give to the Lord more generously. I want to share my testimony and share the gospel more regularly. If it moves you to say any of these things to the Lord, then one by one, I want to ask you to stand and join me in the singing of this glorious old hymn. Alas, indeed, my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I 
Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself. But you have not yet put your trust in Christ who died for your sins upon the cross. In a moment, our praise team is going to lead us as we sing, Just As I Am. And while we do that, you can come to me to say, I want to trust in Christ. You can come to Brother Mark, who will be standing at the front here with me, and say, I want to trust in Jesus. I want to commit my life, surrender my life, invite him to be my Lord and Master. You can come and give your life to him and be saved. We'll also be here if there's someone else who wants to come to be a part of our church. If you want to come and just kneel at the altar to do business with God. While our praise team leads us, you come.